around up there. One of the articles was on Dr. Billings and the work he was doing with the Hydrogen Homestead. It had some data on how to order a little brochure on that. So I went ahead and sent in and got it. It's an excellent little brochure. And that's how I got introduced to Dr. Billings. <laughs> He's uh, currently working with the American Academy of Science in Independence, Missouri. This is his 20th anniversary since he made his first hydrogen car conversion as a high school student. He founded the Billings Corporation in 1972 doing computers and hydrogen research. He sold it out when it got to a $12 million a year business. That was in 1985. And since then, he's been working on his fuel cell. And so for the next period of time here, you'll be hearing a lot about that fuel cell. Here's Dr. Roger Billings. Yeah, I never have figured that out. No, actually, you can do it when you turn it over. Yeah. All this noise goes out of the videotape. There we go. Okay, and this goes in your pocket, and that little red thing has to keep hanging out as long as possible. Very good. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> It's a sincere pleasure for me to be with you tonight and to talk about a subject that is very dear to my heart and one that I've had a lot of opportunities to think about for many years. Before we begin to talk about hydrogen though, I would like to set a couple things straight. First of all, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that introduction. It reminds me of the gentleman who was introduced to speak uh, some time ago at a large conference and the announcer got up and said, and now I'm very happy to introduce to you our guest speaker tonight. Uh, this gentleman made $10 million in the oil and gas business, and it's our pleasure now to hear from him. When he came up to the mic, he said, well, I, I feel it's my duty to set the record straight. Actually, it wasn't $10 million, it was $20 million. And it wasn't the oil and gas business, it was the hydrogen business. <laughs> And it wasn't exactly me, it was my brother, and he didn't make it, he lost it. <laughs> so introductions can be whatever they will be, but it, it is a pleasure for me to be with you and to, to talk about some very uh, unusual technology. I'd like to begin by demonstrating for you one of my recent inventions. Uh, I didn't warn the hosts of the conference that I would be demonstrating this tonight for fear they wouldn't allow me to stay on the program. So this, this is entirely impromptu. But this is something that I've been inventing that certainly falls into the category of extraordinary science. As you can see, I have a bag here. And as you can also see, uh, there's nothing in the bag. Uh, the, the bag is is completely empty. <clears throat> yes, there's a vacuum sweeper and a lot of other things in there too. Now to adequately demonstrate uh, this technology, I need the assistance of a very beautiful assistant. Oh, and seeing that she's right here, would you please come up and help me for a minute? Um, <clears throat> but what is your name, please? Joni, would you please come right up here by me? What I would like to do, uh, come, come right up here. It, it's a pleasure meeting you. Nice to meet Thank you. Thank you very much. You can see that this bag has a zipper on it. And what I would like you to do is just undo the zipper so we can look inside and confirm the fact that there's nothing in this bag except for a vacuum sweeper. Okay, I'm in charge now. It's just, okay. <laughs> just kind of stand right up here. You're doing fine. She's a little nervous. This is the first time she's ever examined this bag. Okay, here we go. Just unzip it slowly. Don't be nervous. You have stage fright, do you? It's okay. Nothing's going to happen, I guarantee it. <laughs> so, again, we confirm that we have a completely empty bag, right? Now zip it back up for me. Okay. What's that? Okay, now what I want you to do 
is to reach inside the bag and pull out the novel new energy source which I've developed. I call this bag energy. You're doing fine, you're doing fine. <laughs> Just pull it out. Very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Now actually, with these chickens, <clears throat> if you shovel up the manure and put it in your car, you've got a real mess. I don't know, That's, that really isn't what I wanted to talk about. <clears throat> really what I wanted to talk about did, did I ever tell you the one about? No, never mind. <laughs> I want to talk about hydrogen. I'm accused of, of being uh, determined to make hydrogen work, and I'd like to, to quickly run through uh, my story, if, if I may, and let you know a little bit of how we came to the point we're at tonight. And then my goal is to progress from that point to let you know where I think things can and should go in the future with the anticipation that when we're all finished, many of you will perhaps help me and the others who are working in this field to make some of the good possibilities with hydrogen energy become a reality. Could I please have the first slide? Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I present to you a hydrogen Briggs & Stratton lawnmower engine. Can we dim the lights a little bit, please? This engine was converted to operate on hydrogen many, many years ago in fact, uh, to be exact, 20 years ago this year. Uh, as a ninth grade science student, I witnessed the demonstration of electrolysis in a science class, the splitting of water using electricity, and the teacher captured hydrogen in a toy balloon, which he then tied a string to. He lit a fire to the string and then let go of the balloon. Of course, it's very lightweight, took it to the top of the classroom, and as the fire burned its way up the string, it finally ignited the hydrogen, and there was a loud pop, and then he wrote something on the board that completely undid me. He said, that ball of fire was water being created. Hydrogen plus oxygen yields water. Uh, I, I, I was completely undone that fire could be hydrogen being turned into water. And so that night I went home and desperately in need of some extra credit in that class, I wrote a paper on converting all of the automobiles in the world to run on hydrogen instead of fossil fuels. I delivered it to my teacher, I earned my extra credit, and I graduated from the ninth grade. That uh, following summer, I attended a special summer course in biology at the local university, and there I asked a, a botanist who later became a dear friend of mine if he thought it was possible to actually run an engine on hydrogen. And he thought back through all of the names of flowers and petals and plants that he had studied, and he said, well, I certainly would think so. Why not? And so I spent the rest of the summer mowing my neighbor's lawn to earn this engine, which I then converted to run on hydrogen. Now, my conversion technique was simple. I acquired a large glass flask, about uh, five liters in capacity. I filled it half full of water. I put a rubber stopper in the top. I calculated the area of two sizes of glass tubing. And I put the glass tubing down in the water so that as the engine would pull a vacuum, it would draw in air and it would also draw in hydrogen. And by having the sizes of the tubing at exactly the right proportion to mix the hydrogen and the air for correct combustion, I had invented a hydrogen carburetor. I then ran the tube out the top of the rubber stopper to the intake of the engine. The particular uh, equipment I used in this first experiment, unfortunately, wasn't available for a photograph. But uh, just as I was ready to, to start the experiment, um, I needed a volunteer. Because you see, for this to work, the pressure of the hydrogen has to be exactly the same pressure as air. And to, to accomplish this, I ran the hydrogen from a welding cylinder into a plastic bag, and I hired my little brother, <laughs> whose job it was to keep the plastic bag exactly half inflated with hydrogen. If it was half inflated, well then it would equalize with air pressure and I would get a perfect mixture of hydrogen and oxygen when I pulled on the rope to start the engine. Well, we had it all ready and then uh, having been raised in a good Christian home, uh, 
we paused before the experiment to uh, communicate with our creator. <laughs> and at the end of our, our praying experience, I felt impressed to make one change to the experiment. I went in the garage. Uh, we were doing the experiment behind the garage. I went in the garage and I, I got my father's heavy canvas military jacket. And we wrapped this flask up in it and we tied it up with ropes. And then I wrapped another rope around the motor and pulled as hard as I could. And the motor started motoring. It sounded like it was going to catch and then it started slowing down, slowing down. And finally it stopped. And then you know how these Briggs and Stratton engines do it? Did that half turn backwards? And it ignited the perfect mixture of hydrogen and oxygen in the tube and the fire went back into the flask and I was grounded for a month. <laughs> <clears throat> when she heard the explosion, my mother came running out of the house and uh, pleasantly, my little brother was not even scratched. The coat was ruined. And she said, I will not sign for any more hydrogen cylinders for you until you're in college. Well, that ended my hydrogen career the summer of, uh, of the ninth grade. But I, I couldn't put the idea of running an engine on hydrogen out of my mind. Uh, as a sophomore in high school, uh, not able to get my engine to run, I did a, a science fair project where I treated seeds with ultrasonic waves and proved that it would make them germinate a lot better, did a real nice display, wrote it up professionally for a 10th grader, and won the local science fair uh, tying for first place. Uh, that gave me a lot of prizes, a little bit of notoriety for a young kid. And so my junior year, I had an obligation to come through again. I had to show well at the science fair. So I got the same engine out, and I tried again to convert it to operate on hydrogen, only this time, having another year and a half of experience under my belt, I had a much more sophisticated approach. Uh, results being such as they were, I don't discuss it. That brings up my first side story for the night, which I'd like to rush through very quickly uh, to substantiate the rumor that I am a scatterbrain. I'm going to be going back and forth all night, and if anyone's still with me at the end of the presentation, then you're scatterbrains too. <coughs> But my story goes like this. You see, there were two chemists that met in college back in the, the days just before World War II. And as they were graduating from the university, they were both drafted into military service into the Army Air Corps with the assignment of monitoring the weather. Well, as one of these chemists was out uh, letting off his hydrogen balloon to monitor wind velocities and directions, he was surrounded by the enemy and taken captive. They blindfolded him, they put him in the back of a truck, and he rode for what seemed like forever until they finally let him out of the truck and took him into a little hut in the middle of a prison camp, unblindfolded him, pushed him on the dirt floor. When he opened his eyes, there was his old college chemistry buddy sitting on the ground looking filthy. What a wonderful reunion to find an old scientist friend from college. Well, this latest captive was determined not to stay in that prison camp. He was going to exercise his scientific training and find a way to escape. So he started analyzing everything, the guard routine, the fence, and within days he had developed a fail-proof plan of escape. And so he presented it to his colleague friend. And his colleague friend just shook his head and said, I don't think so, I don't think so. What do you mean you don't think so? Do you have a flaw with my plan? No, sounds good. Well, then why don't you think so? And these kind of discussions went on for three months until finally the chemist gave up on his friend. He had lost his will to escape, it seemed. And so the night came and he implemented his plan all by himself. Well, being a good scientist and having been very thorough in his planning, it worked. He escaped. He was outside. He was free. And he started making his way back towards friendly lines. It was sometime about the middle of the next day that he realized that the prison camp was located out in the middle of a desert. And without food or water, 
he would have no hope except to turn around and go back. Now turning around and going back wasn't so bad except for one thing. His friend was there. And he would have to face his friend and say, okay, so I was wrong. So what? By that night, thirst forced him to do just that. And, and he went in and turned himself in. The guards took him back to the same room. And he sat down across from his friend and he looked at him. And, and his friend didn't even look up. He just kept drawing a little thing on the floor. And so finally he said, okay, let's get it over. Say it. Say I was wrong. Go ahead. Say I was wrong. I didn't say that. Well, don't you want to know what happened? Okay, tell me what happened. Well, my plan was perfect. I escaped just like I said I would. And I got out and I was free and it felt so good. But guess what? We're in the middle of a desert. I know that. How do you know that? I escaped three months after I got here. Had turned myself in too. <laughs> what do you mean? You mean I risked my life for nothing you knew and you didn't tell me? Why didn't you tell me? And the second chemist looked up at him. He said, a scientist never publishes negative results. <laughs> and so in the spirit of that story, <clears throat> we will not discuss my junior year experiments with the hydrogen engine. We will just jump over that part of the story to my senior year. My senior year, I was determined to get that engine running on hydrogen no matter what it took. And so I wrote a research proposal. And in my research proposal, I requested three hours of consulting from a university professor of mechanical engineering. I knew that if I could get some professional help, I'd be able to solve the problems and get that engine to run. Well, I submitted my proposal to the Utah Academy of Science, Arts, and Letters, and they funded it. They hired the college professor of my choice, and the night before my consulting, I was so excited I couldn't sleep. You ever been that excited about an experiment? Some of you have. And the next day I went in there, I told him what had happened, I told him what I wanted to do. I said, please tell me why this engine won't run. And he pulled a book off his shelf. It was an old book. In fact, I later acquired a copy of it. It was written by Mr. H. Lukey, L-U-C-K-E. It was called The Internal Combustion Engine. It had been a standard textbook for mechanical engineering students for ages. In fact, the original edition was written clear back in the 30s. And he looked in the index and thumbed around and finally he found it. And then he read to me a sentence which I've later memorized. For every 10% hydrogen added to the fuel, you must reduce the highest usable compression ratio by one. Now that didn't mean anything to me in high school. I said, well, what does it mean? What does it mean? What do we got to do? And he says, what that's saying is, if you run an engine on 90% gasoline and 10% hydrogen, and if the engine had a compression ratio of, let's say, 9.5 to 1, then you must lower the compression ratio to 8.5 to 1 to get it to run on 10% hydrogen. 20% hydrogen, 7.5 to 1. 30% hydrogen, six and a half to one, and so forth until you get down to about 85% hydrogen and then it won't run anymore. In other words, Mr. Billings, it can't be done. I wrote that proposal for this. Well, I was, I was destroyed, I was devastated. I went home I put that engine back under my bed where it spent most of the last three years and I started working on how to achieve photosynthesis in a test tube. I had read about a scientist back in 1890 that had a breakthrough in how to do that and his work had never been accepted. And so I got all of the stuff and I reproduced the experiment and it didn't work. I decided he must have been a, a fake. And so I was desperate. This was my last year of high school, and I pulled the engine out. I built the carburetor, which you see. It took me one day in metal shop. It's, it's a 
tube that the air goes in and another tube that the hydrogen goes in. And that tube that the hydrogen goes in goes inside the bigger tube and ends up right on top of the intake valve. And then I hook that tube up to a hydrogen cylinder and I hooked the engine up to an electric motor so it would motor continu continuously while I did my experiment. I turned on the motor, the engine started turning, and then gradually I turned on the hydrogen. And at first it, it backfired, it exploded, did all kinds of things, but after about 15 minutes, it settled down. Started running perfectly. I turned off the electric motor and it kept running. I put my hand on the exhaust, and I could feel a nice, warm, very humid exhaust. After a while, I could feel water vapor condensing on my hand. I had done it. Later, I found out that this old lawnmower engine had a terrible carbon buildup inside the combustion chamber. Hot carbon is a catalyst to ignite hydrogen. And so it was auto-igniting. That was the whole problem. If I'd gone out and got a new engine, I wouldn't have had all those problems. And so, having a tremendous amount of success, the next morning I confronted my father at the breakfast table. I told him what I had done. I says, Father, science is definitely marching forward. And I said, you know that brand new Chevrolet we just bought? <laughs> How would you like it to be the world's first hydrogen car? And he said, well, let me have some time to think about it. But at a, at a time of breakthroughs, you can't wait, can you? So in first period, I talked to my friend, Lynn Barker, one of my fellow cheerleaders, and I said, Lynn, could I use your Volkswagen for an experiment tonight? And he said, no. I said, but it's for science. It's in the name of science. You'll be famous. It'll be the world's first hydrogen car. I took him up to the lab and showed him this engine. And he said, well, OK. And so that night, we tore the carburetor off his engine I made another one of these special carburetors in the metal shop for a Volkswagen, and I was just starting to get it hooked up when my father came around the corner of the science building and said, what are you doing? I said, research. <laughs> and he said, no, you're not. He says, if you're going to blow up anybody's car, it's going to be ours. <laughs> now, my father really had no basis for jumping to that kind of a conclusion about my work. <laughs> or at least, at least he had hardly any basis. And I said, you mean you've brought the new Chevrolet? And he said, no. The new Chevrolet is staying home. You can do it on the Model A. Next slide, please. My father had driven a Model A Ford to work for about 10 years. And you'll notice in this slide, in the back, there is a hydrogen cylinder. You'll notice the surgical tubing going along the running board to the engine. This was sophisticated technology. <laughs> what does not show in this picture, and actually it was the hardest part of this prototype to work out, was my little brother who would sit there and when I wanted to accelerate, I'd go like this and he would open the valve. But it worked. It worked that first night. This car ran on hydrogen. We drove all over town. It wasn't until about four years later that I learned that a Briggs & Stratton lawnmower engine has an L-head combustion chamber design, and the only automobile I know in existence that has that kind of combustion chamber is the Model A Ford. All of the newer engines have hemispherical heads, which work much better on gasoline. I also learned that with that kind of a carburetor, the only engine in the world that would have run on hydrogen was an L-head engine. So I've wondered, who was steering me through the rocks? At any rate, it ran. I immediately started preparing my science fair posters. I took an example of the exhaust, a sample. I ran up to the university and had it tested on a gas chromatograph to prove that the only pollutant was pure water vapor. When the results came out, there was no carbon monoxide, no unburnt hydrocarbons, and 5,500 parts per million of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide? I'd never heard of nitric oxide before. Nitrogen and oxygen, the constituents of air, when they're heated above 2,400 degrees 
2400 degrees Fahrenheit, they react and form nitric oxide. Nitric oxide then undergoes a series of thermal reactions in air forming nitrogen dioxide, then reacting with water to form hydrochloric acid. It's one of the most serious pollutant problems in Southern California and many of our large cities. I don't think any gasoline car ever produced 2,500 parts per million, 5,000 parts per million nitric oxide. But hydrogen burns so fast that the peak combustion chamber temperature was so high that we were producing 10 times more nitric oxide than any gasoline car. And so I put it on my poster, I went to the science fair, I won the local, I won the international. And I think the reason I won was because the judges were so impressed at my honesty to publish my negative results. I hadn't heard the story yet about the two chemists and the, and the prison camp. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Later, I continued to, to uh, work on hydrogen with the encouragement of a lot of wonderful people. Here you see Mr. Bill Lear, father of the Learjet, Motorola, Lear Siegler, 8-track stereo, one of the greatest inventors in the history of this, this country. Bill Lear came to the University, Brigham Young, where I was studying. He took a ride in my hydrogen-powered uh, Model A, which by now had changed colors to the university's official blue and white. And he said, Roger, this is what the world needs. I want you to come to Reno, Nevada and develop your hydrogen engine concept. I will finance everything. You'll live in my home. I want you to be my protege. The following Saturday, uh, about six months before I was to graduate after five years at Brigham Young University, his Learjet picked up my wife, my one-week-old baby, and myself and took us to Reno where we were excited to finally have the facilities and the money to work on our project. When we arrived at Lear Motor Company, I was told we couldn't work on hydrogen until we got it approved by the stockbrokers that were financing the operation. And so Bill Lear asked me if I would convert this Sox Wankel engine to run on jet fuel. He wanted it to run the air conditioner and the auxiliary power generator on his Learjet so that when they didn't have the big uh, jets going, they could still have air conditioning on the ground. And so I did. This is the completed version. You'll notice that I have a carburetor very similar to the one I use for hydrogen. <laughs> it's the only one I knew how to make. But it worked, and he actually uh, put this thing in his Learjet. I was very disappointed to learn, however, that the underwriters of his steam bus that he had been working on for so long said that he couldn't do steam bus and hydrogen. They were too far diverse. The investors had invested in the steam bus, and he couldn't drop that and go to work on something else. And so three months later, I left Reno, Nevada, and went back to Brigham Young, uh, Mr. Lear made a very generous offer to me to work on the steam bus in a very prestigious senior position, but I said, no, I've got to pursue this hydrogen dream. I, I think it's, it's got a future. So I returned just in time to hear about the clean air race, the race between universities to build a pollution-free car. I converted quickly this little Volkswagen to the hydrogen system that I had developed, but while I was at Brigham Young, I had a research grant from the Ford Motor Company to learn how to get rid of the nitric oxide. And according to the computer simulations we did, if you would inject droplets of water with the hydrogen into the combustion chamber, it would cool down the combustion and it would completely eliminate the formation of nitric oxide. You'd have truly a pollution-free car. Unfortunately, there were no grant monies available to try it out. And so two weeks before the contest, we got this car from the local dealer. Uh, he loaned it to us. He said, well, what are you going to do to it? And I said, oh, nothing. <laughs> and we had a little more sophisticated carburetor that inducted the water droplets with the hydrogen. We fired it up. It ran. We didn't have any equipment to measure the emissions available the night we had to test it. The next day, we had to give it to the freight company to ship it to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so we loaded it up, having no idea whether there were nitric oxides or not. When we arrived at the General Motors Proving Ground, they gave us number 303, and we went in for testing. 
Now there were over 50 electric cars involved in the clean air race this year. And the way the, the contest formula worked, they took your nitric oxide pollution, multiplied it time to, times the weighting factor, your carbon monoxide multiplied it times the weighting factor, your hydrocarbons times the weighting factor, added up the score, whoever had the lowest score won. All the electrics had zero, zero, zero times the weighting factor, so their score was a perfect zero. When it came my turn to test, the most I could hope for would be to tie with 50 electric cars for first place. And if I had one scrap of pollutant, then I would be just a little bit dirtier than them, and I would be about number 57. To make things worse, there was one university whose name I will not mention that arrived with a flywheel car. Now the flywheel car would back up to a semi-trailer, uh, actually the tractor of a tractor trailer, and they would rev up the big diesel engine in this in this tractor, and you'd hear it, you'd see a big cloud of smoke as they revved up this flywheel to thousands of RPMs. And then the flywheel car would drive inside the test lab and they would measure no pollution. <laughs> I thought, now wait a minute. That car was given a perfect score. Zero pollution, no tailpipe. Well, our turn came, we went in to have the test, they started running the test, and after a few minutes, the guy inside the window waved to the driver and said, stop, missed test. And then they came out and they recalibrated their instruments. Well, this had happened to the car from the University of Tennessee that had gone just before us. That car ran on ammonia. And they stopped that test three times, then they scrapped it because the nitric oxide was so high from the ammonia car that it was, it was peeking out their analyzer. They couldn't measure it. And so they didn't even get in the contest. And I thought, oh no. I remembered 5,000 parts per million. Well, they ran a test again. And as the test proceeded, finally they completed it. And when they brought out and posted the results, something very interesting had happened. The nitric oxide made by the engine with this water induction was almost negligible. The reason they had stopped is because the emissions were so low they had to recalibrate their instruments on a lower scale and again on the lowest scale. They were down where they could re measure the pollution in ambient air and an interesting thing happened. The nitric oxide was barely detectable but it was there and so we got a score for that which put us behind all of the electrics and the flywheel car. But then they measured carbon monoxide the carbon monoxide in air went into the engine and was oxidized, as was the hydrocarbons. We had a negative CO level. We had a negative hydrocarbon level. When they added it up, our score was negative .002. <laughs> the emissions engineer came out of the room and posted the score. The press was all watching. They said, this car cleans the air as it dries. <laughs> We made international headlines. The Los Angeles Times picked up the story, but they polluted the headline. They said, this car would probably stall trying to drive in Los Angeles air. <laughs> One guy called me up and said, why don't you put four giant engines on each of the four corners of Los Angeles, clean up the whole smog problem? Well, we had an exciting beginning. At last, the world recognized that this technology was viable. Engines did run on hydrogen and they made no air pollution. The only thing coming out of that tailpipe was a little bit of pure nitrogen and water vapor. Mr. Saunders here from the Environmental Protection Agency came right over to see the car and said, Roger, what are you going to do with this? And I said, well, I want to continue developing it. He said, we would like to give you a grant. We can give you up to $330,000 if you'd like. And I said, well, <laughs> I would like. And so I went back to the university and I told them I have a grant coming from the EPA. And they said, well, we don't do this kind of research at the university. You've graduated now. You're not on the faculty. Um, we really can't accommodate you.
So then I formed the uh, <clears throat> Pollution Control Research Institute, a not-for-profit research institute, and applied for tax-exempt status because this particular grant could only go to not-for-profit organizations. And the Internal Revenue Service would not give me a tax exemption. I flew back to Washington to meet with the examiner along with one of the vice presidents of the university and we sat there and he said, you mean to tell me that your only motive in doing this is to improve the world and for the benefit of mankind? I said, yes. He said, I don't believe you. Denied. <laughs> and so we couldn't get the grant from the EPA and I came back home and instead I formed the Energy Research Corporation. Later, the Energy Research Corporation of St. John, Minnesota told me that was their name, get off it. And so my board changed our name to the Billings Energy Research Corporation, which was later sh shortened to Billings Corporation. I applied for grants and the Kettering Foundation in Dayton, Ohio gave me an $8,000 grant and with that we started a little corporation. The company's first goal was to solve the next nagging problem. We had a pollution-free car, but with four cylinders in the back seat, charged with hydrogen at 2,000 pounds per square inch, we could only go 20 miles. And if you've ever gotten an accident, oh boy, hydrogen bombs. Well, working with Beach Aerospace uh, up in Boulder, Colorado, we developed a liquid hydrogen car. Here you can see the liquid hydrogen tank. Uh, you can see it also in the next slide with uh, my good friend who lives here in Colorado now, Mr. Frank Lynch. I met Frank at the clean air race. He was in charge of the team that built the UCLA hydrogen car and he came in right after us in emissions. He used exhaust gas recirculation to control his nitric oxide, but it didn't work as good as water induction. Frank and I became good friends and he came to work for me and we built this prototype vehicle. Well, liquid hydrogen is an interesting material. To liquefy hydrogen, you can't do it with pressure. You must cool it to 422.9 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. That's a temperature so cold that the lines filling the tank cause oxygen and nitrogen to liquefy and drip. It's a very expensive proposition to liquefy hydrogen. And the equipment is also very difficult to maintain. I believe someday we will see hydrogen as a fuel for aviation. It's already the fuel of the space shuttle. But I don't suspect we'll be using liquid hydrogen for private automobiles. It's too expensive. The equipment to store it is way too expensive and very complex. And besides that, you waste a lot of energy liquefying it. Next slide, please. We had to find a better way to store hydrogen. So next we jumped on the idea of storing it in a powdered form. A gentleman named Jim Riley of the Brookhaven National Laboratories had said, you can react hydrogen with certain metal alloys and form an intermetallic compound which theoretically could be dissociated to give off hydrogen and then recharged and dissociated it. It soaks up hydrogen gas like a sponge, turning it into a powder. Well, Mr. Riley made some little laboratory experiments that indicated that the technology should work, but there were a lot of very difficult engineering problems to be solved. I located this gentleman named Dr. Don McKay at Rice University in Texas. Dr. McKay had written several graduate school textbooks on the thermodynamics and heat transfer. He was probably one of the most capable people in the world in solving difficult heat transfer problems. And these metal hydride tanks had to be one of the best heat transfer problems there ever was. Don came to work for me at Billings Corporation. We built this metal hydride tank, which he is standing in the picture with. We put it on that same Monte Carlo with the liquid hydrogen tank, and it didn't work. <laughs> uh, but we learned enough from it to build a second generation technology, which was put on a Pontiac Granville. Now hydrides are very, very, very safe ways of storing hydrogen. Here we have a bonfire in which we had placed a fully charged metal hydride tank. The Army came and shot armor-piercing incendiary bullets through these tanks. They still couldn't get them to explode. There's never been a safer way to store a fuel 
than in a metal hydride if you can just get it out. Next slide. In this next slide, you'll see a metal hydride tank. It's wrapped in an insulative material, but inside that material are tubes which contain a powder consisting of iron and titanium, 50-50. Later we learned there are better alloys than pure iron titanium. Later tanks we added impurities of manganese which made the system work much better. But you charge this tank exactly like you inflate a tire. You hook up a gas line of hydrogen, let the hydrogen flow in at moderate pressure, 200, 250 PSI, and it forms this powder and gives off heat. You have to dissipate the heat to recharge it, but you can recharge one of these hydride tanks in about 10 minutes. And when it's through being charged, you have a very stable, safe, powdered form of hydrogen to put on a vehicle. Next slide. Here you can see it inside the trunk of the Pontiac Granville. We had it tucked up underneath the window, and this time it worked. It didn't give us a lot of range because we still had a lot of little problems to work out. And the hydride tank was quite heavy. This particular tank weighed a couple hundred pounds and still only gave us about a 50 mile range. But it was the beginning of a very exciting solution on how to store hydrogen safely. Here you see a much later prototype. This is a car we converted for Peugeot of Paris. Now the hydride tanks are uh, much less expensive. These are aluminum vessels filled with the hydride material and instead of running exhaust over the tank like we did in the Pontiac Granville, we ran a small amount of radiator water from the engine and that little bit of warmth dissociated the hydrogen and let the gas go up to the engine as it was required on demand. This car had a 150 mile range with a hydride tank weighing 300 pounds. Now 300 pounds was all the weight that Peugeot could handle on their chassis. And 150 mile range was better than a lot of the electrics, but to the people at Peugeot, it just wasn't good enough. We had another major problem. To produce hydrogen, you've got to have water and some source of energy. And when we use the energy to split up the water, the hydrogen end up costing about 20, 25% more than the gasoline. The result was pollution free, but people didn't like the limited range and they didn't like to pay an extra quarter a gallon for fuel. So we had a hard time getting anyone very excited. That didn't stop us, however. Here we have a metal hydride tank inside our laboratory in front of all the press and we're cooking it, showing them how safe this tank is. I challenge any of you to do that with a gasoline tank. Next slide. Hydrides are extremely safe. Well, about that time, the Arab oil embargo came along and everybody wanted to thumb their nose at the Arabs. And so all of a sudden, we had a groundswell of support for our research. One of the projects that didn't seem to mind the heavy weight of the metal hydrides was a bus. A bus can carry a lot of weight. And so we built the world's first hydrogen bus. In this next slide, you'll see uh, a side shot of a bus that operated in Provo and Orem, Utah. Next slide. Here you can actually see it in service. This bus drove like any other bus. It carried hydrogen in tanks, two tanks, each weighing 1,000 pounds. The tanks would give the bus a four-hour operating range. Well, not good, but not too bad when you consider how safe it was. Next slide. Going from that start in technology, uh, you'll notice we have two buses running together. The first bus is the hydrogen one. The second one is the diesel bus. The bus company said, I won't force people to run in the hydrogen bus. And we had to paint hydrogen on it because he wanted to warn the public what they were getting into. And he, w he was afraid no one would ride in it. Well, it turned out that the public accepted the bus very well in spite of how fearful they were supposed to be of hydrogen. Also, the US Post Office came forward with funding and we converted a hydrogen uh, mail delivery vehicle. Uh, this vehicle was the first prototype. We went on to a later prototype and this uh, uh, prototype was actually used to deliver mail by the US Post Office for one year. 
project was very successful, but the post office says we can't afford to pay 25% extra for fuel. We're all for making the air clean, but you know, we, we, we do this mail delivery for such a low price that we just can't afford to spend more money on fuel. One of uh, my friends says, you know, I wonder if the post office is really charging us to deliver the mail or, or store it. But anyway, <clears throat> next slide. Uh, we were very grateful to the post office for their support. Here you can see the conversion of the engine and a very young Roger Billings without a beard. But although we could get the project to work technically, we couldn't get anyone excited enough about going forward. Here's the line where we connect to the vehicle, a little quick connect, you open the valve, hydrogen gas flows in, reforms the hydride, everything worked flawlessly, or nearly flawlessly, except for the economics. Then the state of California, Department of Transportation, uh, and the city of Riverside contacted us and they wanted to contract another bus only they wanted a newer technology. They needed a eight hour range on the bus. And so the second world's hydrogen bus was built, the Riverside bus. This bus had a hydrogen tank which also weighed 2,000 pounds, but we doubled the amount of hydrogen we could store because now we were starting to learn how to make this metal hydride material better. Um, the tanks in this bus actually are still in use. They've been pulled off the bus and used in other prototypes, and they're still working extremely well. They've been through the equivalent of about one million miles of driving, and there's no degradation in the metal hydride material. So that's exciting. I have to tell you a story about when we inaugurated the Riverside bus. Uh, we were in Riverside, California, supposedly one of the smog capitals of the world. You know, Southern California is a beautiful area. They have these beautiful mountains, but you can never see them for the smog. And so I wrote my speech. I flew back to Riverside. Here we are, the morning of the inauguration. I'm standing there on the podium, and my opening remarks say, as we look around, we should be able to see the pristine beauty of the lovely Southern California mountains. But we can't see it because of smog. And then I looked up, and wouldn't you know it, the one day a year when the wind blew in from the desert and the mountains were beautiful. If I had just read that line silently before I read it out loud, I wouldn't have been so embarrassed. And now the press was smirking, and, and I, I needed a comeback, and so I went on. It wasn't on my script, I made this up, and I says, and if just one hydrogen bus can clean up the air like this, think what a whole fleet could do. <laughs> Next slide. <clears throat> well, people got excited in Washington at, at the Energy Research and Development Administration, and the secretary of the DOE uh, gave us funding to come back and do some projects with federal money, which culminated in our hydrogen Cadillac Seville uh, can you push the side button up and down there? Maybe that'll make it drop in. Right there. Yeah, push that one. There it is. The hydrogen Cadillac Seville was in the inaugural parade for Jimmy Carter. And we know now the federal government's going to get behind us. Notice the Energy Research and Development logo right up there by the front wheel. We had federal support now and the project is really going to get underway. Then we started one of the most exciting projects we've ever done. Um, in my opinion, a real demonstration of the full potential of hydrogen energy. We built the world's first hydrogen home, the Hydrogen Homestead. This home built in Provo, Utah in 1975 and 1976 was completely fueled by hydrogen. Here's a schematic showing the system. Hydrogen was produced from electricity, utilizing energy which came from a solar array and from the grid. The hydrogen then was used to, uh, to fuel the oven, the stove, the barbecue, the fireplace, the lawnmower, the hydrogen Seville automobile in the garage. And uh, this was a demonstration of the fact you can convert any energy appliance to run on hydrogen. 
Here's some of the equipment. Here's the hydrogen range. This range was donated by the Tappan Corporation, who also funded the research into the technology to convert a range. And we ended up with an interesting patent on how to do that. Turns out hydrogen's an ideal fuel for a range, but some tricky technology was involved in order to make the conversion possible. We, we uh, heated the home with a hydrogen heat pump. Next slide. I'll run through these quickly. And here, looking at the home early in the morning from the back, you can see the little building, which we called the energy shack. That's where the hydrogen was generated. You can see the solar collectors on the, on the roof, and it's where it was also stored. This tank we lovingly call R2-D2, after the movie Star Wars. This tank held 3,000 pounds of metal hydride material and was the world's largest metal hydride vessel and it stored the hydrogen, enough hydrogen, to run the homestead for about 23 days. This is the hydrogen-fueled lawnmower. Again, you can see the metal hydride tank on the back of the vehicle. And at last, the source of hydrogen was this hydrogen electrolyzer. Uh, to produce hydrogen, we developed a, a new exciting technology where we used a polyperfluorinated membrane to electrolyze water and produce hydrogen at pressure. The hydrogen comes right out of that cell and goes right into our hydride tank and does so without a compressor. All of these things making the whole idea a lot more practical. And there's the whole electrolysis unit, which we actually began to manufacture and sell commercially. Well, Billings Corporation uh, did very well, fortunately, in the computer field. Uh, we put out one of the very first microcomputers or personal computers and sold thousands of them. These were back in the days when Apple was just being established. We also began to manufacture floppy disk drives and became the co-owners of the patent for the double-sided floppy disk, uh, which technology uh, resulted in the company generating an enormous amount of cash flow, all of which we invested in hydrogen research. But the oil embargo ended and people forgot about the embargo and we started lowering the price of gasoline again and people went to sleep. The lines at the service stations went away and people forgot about alternative fuels. Our support disappeared and very soon it was business as usual. Pollution back in the air, gasoline being burnt and very little funding. Meanwhile, my shareholders at Billings Corporation, which was now 13 years old, said, let's quit spending all of our money on hydrogen. Let's take these profits and uh, give it to the shareholders. And so I had to make a decision, and the decision I made was I didn't want to go after a profit in the computer field. I wanted to pursue the hydrogen dream. So I sold out my interest in the Billings Corporation and went to work on the hydrogen fuel cell. Now remember, the reason that people didn't get excited about hydrogen was because it costs more. I decided the only way we're ever going to make hydrogen go is make it cost less. And yet, no one seemed to have a way to make hydrogen cost less. Maybe some people at this conference do, and I sincerely hope they do, but uh, I couldn't find a way, based on any real science that I was privy to, that we could make hydrogen cost less. So I decided the secret's got to be to use hydrogen better, to use hydrogen more efficiently. We had built a prototype where we took this electric car, we pulled out the lead acid batteries, we replaced it with a hydride tank and an internal combustion engine, and for the same weight, we had increased the range by a factor of three. What if, instead of putting an internal combustion engine in the car, what if we put a fuel cell in the car? Now what is a fuel cell? A fuel cell is a black box that you put hydrogen and oxygen into and you get out water vapor and electricity. But the advantage over an internal combustion engine is that a fuel cell is three times as efficient. 300% more efficient than an internal combustion engine. If we could make a fuel cell that would fit in an automobile and be affordable, we'd be able to cut the cost of driving on hydrogen in half of what it costs to run on gasoline. Now the space shuttle 
generates all the electricity to run its computers by three fuel cells. The Apollo program to the moon would have been impossible without a hydrogen fuel cell to power the equipment when the solar collectors were in the shade. So fuel cells were real. They were a technology that was well known. But the fuel cell for the space shuttle, each one of them cost $1 million to refurbish after every launch. And I won't tell you how much they cost to make. A little steep for most people. You know, your, your monthly maintenance on your fuel cell, a million bucks, no problem. And worse than that, those fuel cells would never fit inside a car. You'd have to pull it in a trailer because one to power a car would be so large. Well, <clears throat> we had taken our vehicles to Washington and we told them we need some support to develop this hydrogen fuel cell. We can make one that will fit in a car if we get some support. We didn't. We got zero support. So with the funds that we got by selling our stock in Billings Corporation, we started work on a solid polymer fuel cell. Now, a solid polymer is a, a material that looks like a thin sheet of plastic. It's clear, it's like a report cover, except it costs a lot more. And chemically, it's like Teflon, except it has sulfonate compounds uh, or, or molecules attached to the Teflon chains. And when you put it in water, chemically, it looks like a very strong acid. And yet it's very stable. It's a tough, brittle piece of material. Well, we knew that a piece of uh, polyperfluorinated membrane or proton exchange membrane could be used in a fuel cell to transport a hydrogen proton through the membrane. And then the electron would have to go around the outside to react with the oxygen and form water. And as it went around the outside, it would run through a wire and would run the wire through a motor so it'd have to do some work to get there. Here is one of those cells that has a stack of these proton exchange membranes in it which generates electricity by running hydrogen through it. This particular cell is what we call a third generation technology. Over six years my team and I worked on ways to get this technology smaller, more inexpensive, more lightweight and finally, we came up with a, a method of making these cells that employs a, a uh, high-powered laser, which made them extremely compact. Here is the laser, which we, we purchased and then modified to fabricate the canodes that are used in the cell. Now, the canodes are the plates that go on both sides of this plastic-looking sheet of membrane material. When you stack these things up, and run hydrogen through them, hydrogen and air, then you get out electricity very efficiently. Here is one of the canodes uh, that has been produced by the laser. This is what they look like before we put them in the cell. Now the cell uh, has undergone an extensive amount of testing and the results have been so encouraging that we decided that it was feasible to put one of these units into an automobile. Of course, the dream, the goal of our project was to put it in an automobile. We thought, well, we'll first have to put it in a bus because it'll be too big for a car. Meanwhile, the US Department of Energy has funded a program to build a fuel cell bus. And that fuel cell bus is going to use a phosphoric acid fuel cell. And they're putting it in a bus because it'll take up 25% of the space of the vehicle because these things are very voluminous. A phosphoric acid fuel cell is the technology that's in the space shuttle. This cell that you see here is about 1 20th the size of a phosphoric acid fuel cell. So it's very, very compact. And even one more, here is a, a, a next generation cell where we actually change to the laser technology. This is one third more uh, one third the size of the cell you just saw and this is getting down to the technology we're using today. So we did proceed to uh, build a fuel cell which could be put in a car and a lot of interesting things began to happen. We started getting interest from a lot of people. Here is a project which we are doing for the Lockheed Corporation. They make an underwater diving machine for the military and here is a fuel cell which we are testing for them for that application. We haven't put one in that vehicle yet, but it's looking very promising. 
And here is our first attempt to put the fuel cell in the car. We put this fuel cell in the car, and it did run, but the car did not have enough power to really be very drivable. And so we pulled it out like so many of you others have had to do with your project. We tore it apart, we refined the system, we scratched our heads, and we built the next generation fuel cell, which I'll show you in just a minute, and we had plenty of power. This is the world's first fuel cell automobile. We call it Laser Cell One. The car had a sneak preview last month in Pennsylvania where it was unveiled by the Pennsylvania Department of Energy who provided part of the funding for building this prototype. The car will really be unveiled technically at the World Hydrogen Conference on September 16th in uh, Independence, Missouri. Would certainly like to invite any of you who would like to come and see the car to uh, please attend that conference. In fact, I have programs for the conference here if anyone's interested. On board Laser Cell 1, hydrogen is stored in a metal hydride container which is located here in the back part of the vehicle. Now this container is 300 pounds in weight. It's exactly the size you would put in a car like this to give the car a 150 mile range if the car has an internal combustion engine. But this car does not have an internal combustion engine. It has a fuel cell. So that same 300 pound tank can give the vehicle a 450 mile range. You see what we're doing? We solved our weight problem on the hydride by using the hydrogen three times as efficiently. We also solved our cost problem. Electricity is an expensive way to buy, buy fuel or buy energy. But if you plug this car in overnight, you can actually operate the car, all the efficiency calculations made, for the equivalent of buying gasoline at 75 cents a gallon. If you make it from natural gas, depending on where you live, you're talking more like 20 to 25 cents per gallon of gasoline equivalent because the car does not waste energy like the internal combustion engine does. The equipment under the hood is the secret, and I'm going to show you this equipment piece by piece. First of all is, well, well, here's the whole system. On the far left is the hydrogen fuel cell itself. In the middle is the hydrogen control heat exchanger system, and on the right is the hydrogen compressor. And I'll show you each one of these pieces. This is the compressor. This was the last breakthrough that we needed to make the car a reality. When we put the first fuel cell in the car, we, we bought a commercial air compressor to compress the air and push it through the fuel cell. That compressor consumed 20 to 30 percent of the total power output by the fuel cell just to compress the air, which was a terrible disappointment. Um, it ruined the range, it ruined everything. And so we went back to the drawing board and we designed this compressor which utilizes hydrogen pressure from the hydride tank to compress the air, waste energy to do the work of compressing. So now we don't waste any of the electricity from the fuel cell to compress air. And I might say it works extremely well. Uh, air Products Corporation, who served as the safety monitors on this project, they analyzed the design so we could get a safety permit to run on the highway. They said they think this compressor is as big of a scientific breakthrough as a fuel cell, and I must say uh, my team is inclined to agree with them. In the next slide, you'll see the hydrogen control system to the left of the compressor. In this system, we run the exhaust from the fuel cell through a heat exchanger, which then provides the heat to warm the passenger compartment and also to warm the metal hydride to free up the hydrogen so you can drive. Now oh, it's interesting, we've got some interesting things here. Most electric cars waste electricity to heat the passenger compartment, or as on a post office fleet of electric cars, they have gasoline tanks with gasoline heaters to heat the driver while they run on electricity, which I think is completely insane. In this case, we have waste heat to heat the driver's compartment and the hydride. And another thing, when you take the hydrogen out of the hydride, the hydride gets very cold. It gets down to as low as 30 degrees below zero. 
And so we used the hydride to provide free air conditioning during the summer. Two very, very nice side benefits of the fuel cell car. Well, this heat exchanger controls those functions. And finally, here is the latest laser cell uh, version. Uh, it looks real nice in person. It's made out of stainless steel and a lot of very nice parts for the sake of being photogenic and reliable. In production, these will be made out of mild steel and aluminum. But this fuel cell produces 17 and a half kilowatts of peak power, which is enough to drive the vehicle. We also have an accelerator battery. So when you want to accelerate fast, we take the power out of the fuel cell and the battery to give you very crisp ac acceleration. And then when you start cruising down the road, the fuel cell recharges the battery for your next acceleration. That's the end of the slides. Can we have the lights back on, please? Well, since we unveiled the hydrogen fuel cell car a month ago, uh, we have seen a lot of interest in this technology. Uh, now, <clears throat> some people have accused me of personally orchestrating the Middle East war to generate interest in my project. And uh, I, I will neither admit or deny that rumor, <laughs> but it was interesting that that conflict with all of the environmental problems of the burning of the oil fields and, and the Valdez accident, everything, have begun to highlight to the serious people of this world, we've got to do something different. We can't go on burning oil, ignoring the planet like we've done for so long without facing the consequences. Already, the climate of this earth is starting to change. We have very, very, very cold winters at places far down south where it shouldn't be cold. Orange trees that were 30 years old have been frozen in the last two or three years in parts of Florida. Cold, cold winters are a result of global warming. Higher temperatures at the poles cause more rapid rise of hot air which pulls cold air down further than ever before. Ladies and gentlemen, we have serious problems that we need to face. Unfortunately, the power of the large vested interests in oil seems to have a stranglehold on the people making legislative decisions. I used to have an office in Washington, D.C. with a full-time staff to lobby Congress to get support for hydrogen. We had hydrogen bills drafted and submitted only to be lost somewhere in committee. No one wanted to take credit of voting against it, so it never got voted upon. We have a wonderful system established by men who I believe received divine inspiration when they drafted our Constitution. But now we have vested interests that have found ways to break down that system, and we're in trouble. If I could, I would go in and I would reform our whole system and make it work perfect. But I don't think I can. And yet something must be done. And I think it's got to be done by the scientists of this planet. I think they're going to have to come up with extraordinary solutions to extraordinary problems. And we've got to do it in such a way that no vested interest can stop it. I now work for the not-for-profit American Academy of Science. My research is supported by $25 contributions from people all over the world. We have got to give people a technology that they can grab a hold of and go forward with in spite of everybody. And fortunately, I think the hydrogen fuel cell car is one of those technologies. One technology won't do it, though. One answer isn't enough. We need many answers coming in in many areas of the problem, for the problem is complex and overwhelming. But I'm pleased to announce to you today that there is so much demand for these cars. There are so many people wanting to buy fleets and singles and doubles and triples that we have finally caught the ear of the automotive industry. In this past month, I've been contacted 
by two major oil companies and by dozens of automobile companies, all of whom want to become part of the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle consortium we're forming for the purpose of being able to get this technology available. And we're not going to give it to anybody. We're not going to try and make a lot of money. Fortunately, I have a very visionary woman, my lovely wife, Tanya. And when we sold our corporation, she knew that all the money we got would go into hydrogen research. And so she got just enough and put it in a pillowcase to make sure that we don't need to worry about that. And it, it was a wise thing because now we don't need a profit motive. Our motive with this project is to profit the planet. And I put out a call tonight, a call to all people with similar kinds of motivation. Let's work together and find ways to overcome every obstacle, every impediment to new technologies which are really needed going forward. Those of you that are also working in the field of hydrogen energy, I congratulate you for your wisdom and foresight and encourage you forward in your efforts. I believe hydrogen is a technology which is technologically viable and with things like the fuel cell is also financially viable. My goal in 30 months is to have equipment available, affordably priced, through more than one manufacturer, where people, just good old ordinary people like us, can buy this equipment and stick it on their car and save money. Do it financially, affordably. We're going to need a lot of help. We've got a lot of problems to overcome. But I believe the help's there. I, I believe in America. I believe in the creative genius that's made this nation great. And I also believe that we have people like that all around the world. And if we'll unite together, we can solve these problems and we can solve them in time. Thank you very much for your kindness. <clears throat>